Thanks very much, Alicia. It's a great pleasure to be here. I uh, only get to Kalgoorlie every few years, so it's terrific. The, the talk I want to give is uh, with actually uh, work that we've done with myself and my son, Adrian, in uh, looking at uh, different targeting mechanisms that I hope will be of interest. But first of all, just a bit of an introduction on myself, for those who don't know me. I started my geological career with Geopico, a company that you probably don't, most of you wouldn't have heard of, exploring in the Northern Territory, Queensland and Tasmania for about 14 years from 1970 to 1984. And this was a particularly successful period for Geopico. Um, they found new ore deposits in Tennant Creek they had IOCG, copper gold systems. The Alligator Rivers, Ranger, Uranium deposits were found by Geopico in 1970-71. Mount Chalmers, a VHMS in Queensland, a copper gold system. They found the Parks Porphyry District in New South Wales, which has turned out to be a major porphyry district. And the Lake Cowl uh, deposit in New South Wales. And that was all in that 14 year period. So I was very fortunate to be working for a highly successful company. And th in those days, Geopico and Western Mining were put on a pedestal as the, the best explorers in Australia. Sadly, Geopico got taken over, or the Pico Walls End Company got taken over by um, Norths, who got taken over by CRA, who got taken over by Rio Tinto. And, you know, that's the story as it goes. So after 14 years in uh, Geopico, I was heading for a career in management and I didn't really want to go into management at that time because I felt I had a lot of value still in exploration and research. So I decided to take a job at the University of Tasmania uh, as a lecturer so that I could teach and research on the um, experience that I'd learnt about mineral exploration when I worked for Geopico. There weren't many universities in Australia at that time that were teaching much about mineral exploration. All the courses were far more academic on the origin of various uh, rock types. And uh, I felt that we needed to be running courses that were far more relevant to those that were going into the mineral exploration industry. And that that is what I did there and we established the Masters of Economic Geology not long after I was there and um, that's turned out to be an incredibly successful course that many of and maybe some people here have also uh, been able to do. I also started up the Codes Research Centre um, and ran that for about 23 years when I retired and over the last eight years I've been consulting for various junior companies, exploring for a range of ore deposit types, massive sulphide, sediment hosted lead zinc, porphyry copper and scarn deposits. <clears throat> so I've, I've thought about what I'd talk about today and, and I thought that maybe I could talk about what I see as significant innovations that have occurred in mineral exploration since I worked in the 1970s and what explorers do today. It's quite a different different um, landscape today uh, to what it used to be. And that's partly because of our education systems, uh, but it's partly due to the, um, the technology, the computing and all the power of the new approaches we have. And I want to talk about two in particular, and that's the availability of big data which wasn't available back then. We were lucky to be able to put, you know, 100 geochemical samples together and they were usually only analysed for copper, lead, zinc and maybe gold, although that was very expensive. Whereas nowadays we've got these th hundreds of thousands of data points 
and they're most of them are multi-element. And the other thing I want to talk about is the multi-element geochemistry and how that can be used now very powerfully in mineral exploration and how the portable XRF has um, changed the landscape again. The, well, I'll talk about what I call human intelligence rather than artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence is more of a black box that comes out with an answer but you don't really know how the answer was obtained. Whereas with human intelligence we're using our brains to interpret the data and come up with, in our case, targets for exploration. And we'll deal with multi-element data sets that are provided mainly by governments or by uh, putting company data together. That data needs to be screened. We need to produce algorithms that are relevant to the targets we're looking for. We put it through the iGAS software, which is again a revolution in geochemistry software, and then through Q QGIS and maybe even through Google Earth if required. Now I want to talk about how we applied this to Alaska in the search for intrusion related gold deposits and volcanic hosted massive sulphides and how we followed that up uh, with an exploration program in the Wiseman district in the Brooks Range. And lastly if I've got time I hope I can talk about the power of the handheld XRF in sorting out alteration mineralogy, especially for geologists working on in chip drilling on RC rigs or uh, AC rigs, which are a real difficulty for the rig geologists to interpret the rock types. So let's look at Alaska. <clears throat> they, the government of Alaska has a data set of about 260,000 stream sediment and rock samples analysed for 51 elements and that gives us 3.3 million pieces of data and that's the sort of volume of data you need to be able to apply these techniques whether you call it AI or as I call it HI. <coughs> the, most of the analyses of, uh, were ICPMS and some AAS which is an old analytical technique. Many of the analyses didn't have gold associated with them and yet gold was the target in most cases but when you've got good multi-element data sets you can machine learn the data to produce gold analyses that are about 90 percent accurate and that's something that's becoming fairly common um, and it's a real valuable thing that artificial intelligence has told us or machine learning as it should be called. So why do we start with geochem data when we're doing this sort of assessment of a big data set or a jurisdiction? And I would suggest that it's the best detection method for near surface mineralisation. You're actually analysing for the element that you're looking for and you're analysing for a whole bunch of other elements that are likely to be associated with that target. Geology is great to have, but it's not a targeting method. And geophysics is great to have, but it's rarely a targeting method, only in certain circumstances. So from that geochemical data set, we define what the target element is, what the pathfinder elements are, what the host rocks are likely to be, and what, what out of that geochemistry we can use to characterise the right host rock. And then we can even look at the alteration we expect around that target and use the geochemistry to help us understand those altered rocks. We assess the anomalies on the basis of a percentile approach. So you're looking usually at the top 10% of the data set and you're discarding the other 90%. And the anomalies are then screened according to geology, magnetics, radiometrics when it's available. So let's look at IRGS targets in the Tintina Belt in Alaska. We did this in uh, 2022 for a company that was wanting to pick up ground in Alaska for intrusion related gold deposits and they found 
dominantly in the Tintina Gold Province, which you can see there is this Arcuit Province um, in central Alaska that has a number of the major intrusion-related gold deposits. Just shown here in a bit more detail, Fort Knox, about 5.7 million ounces of 0.4 grams, and uh, Pogo, the deposit that uh, Northern Star is now mining, about 5.6 million ounces at a much higher grade, over 12 grams per tonne. And that district extends into the Yukon, where you've got Dublin Gulch at about 4.8 million ounces, and uh, then over to the west, where you've got uh, the Donlan Creek deposit, which is yet to be developed, uh, 32 million ounces, a very large, large deposit there. So they're great targets to be exploring for. <clears throat> the model for intrusion-related gold been developed by the Canadians largely. Um, here's a diagram from Lang showing the relationship between the intrusion, generally felsic uh, intrusions of um, low oxidation potential. They're quite often magnetite series intrusions, or um, no, sorry, ilmenite series intrusions. Some of them are weakly magnetic, some of them are non magnetic and you've got mineralisation at various levels associated with that, those intrusions, as you could see there. And the majority of deposits are described as either rapid zonal IRGSs, which have particular characteristics and pathfinders, and alteration, or mesothermal IRGS, with a different set of pathfinders and alteration. So the algorithm we developed for IRGS targets is obviously the target element is gold. The high level pathfinders are antimony, arsenic, silver and mercury. The deeper pathfinders are bismuth, lead, tellurium and tungsten. The host rocks, the main intrusions that relate to these deposits are Cretaceous intrusions that have particular ratios like the titanium zirconium or scandium thorium ratio. And when you've got a good data set like this data set is, you can home in on those ratios not only in the rock samples, but even the stream sediment samples will give you information about those ratios and about the pathfinder elements. And then you've got the alteration elements, sodium, potassium, barium, etc. And each of those parameters is input into the algorithm you're looking for. And that approach came up with the 12 top targets in the Tintina belt, as shown there, that were ranked according to their um, where they sat on, on the percentiles in the, either greater than 95, greater than 90 or greater than 85. You can see them listed there. The first thing you do with a target list like this is to see whether you've found the deposits you know they're there. Because if you haven't found those, well, you know the technique really isn't working. So we go to Donlan, uh, the biggest of the deposits in that district, and we certainly found that with about six targets sitting on the Donlan gold system, which is associated with these uh, parallel dikes of, um, of felsic Cretaceous rocks uh, within a, a sedimentary, a metamorphosed sedimentary package. So we found the best target. We can go to another target, which is not a known deposit at all. We called ALT4. That was a stream sediment series of anomalies um, with very good characteristics. It had the features of the lower IRGS and it was an area of open ground with quartz tourmaline veins um, indicated. So out of those 12 targets, we found about half of them were open ground and half of them were pegged by other, other companies. So you've got an immediate system where you can go in and peg those targets when you're dealing with a place like Alaska which has a lot lower density of tenure. Um, many of those targets shown in red here seem to fit on a rectangular grid as shown which may be telling us about basement faults that have led the plumbing system up to those sites of potential mineralisation with Donlan shown there um, this, with this area of pegging uh, around Donlan where the potential mine site is. 
The other interesting thing when you compare those targets to the regional magnetics that's available from the government, you can see that most of those red and purple dots are sitting in an area of low magnetics. Um, even though some of the causative intrusions are weakly magnetic, overall there's not a particular magnetic signature for the region that the gold deposits occur in. But remember, this is a very regional data set. Also, we were interested to look at the relationship between the orogenic gold targets and the IRGS targets because there's been a long-standing argument in the North American literature of whether these so-called intrusion-related gold deposits are actually intrusion-related or whether they're just orogenic, typical orogenic deposits. And so we used a second algorithm which looks at the characteristics of orogenic deposits as described in the literature. And when you apply that, you find that although all the blue dots and red dots are sitting in this consistent belt, many of the orogenic blue, uh, green triangles are sitting over here in a different belt of rocks altogether. But when you get to the Fort Knox Pogo area, it's very interesting that around Fort Knox, most of the indicated targets are the IRGS, intrusion related, but around Pogo, most of the indicated targets are actually orogenic gold targets. Now that's quite interesting because there's a big difference between those two deposits and that's the grade of gold. Pogo is much richer in gold than Fort Knox is. And it's always been thought that the IRGS deposits, although they can be very big, are generally low grade. But uh, this story has got a long way to go. I, I can't really contribute to it. Um, and we'll find out as the argument goes in the, in the gold fields here, how important intrusions are relative to the orogenic gold deposits. Are they the, the real part of the story or are they just happen to be there and are unrelated to the gold. I think Alicia is fa fairly on the side of the intrusions, but if we had Dave Groves here, I'm sure he'd tell us that's a load of bumping <laughs> and it's all orogenic metamorphic. Well, let's move to the HMS targets. The same approach was taken uh, in looking at the high probability and low probability areas that you might peg based on that geochemical database. There's two main areas that we were interested in. The northern one, which is the southern Brooks Range, and the southern one, which is the, the main Alaskan range. Um, and if we focus, first of all, on the algorithm that we used, the target elements, we were targeting copper gold rich VMS, which are the, the best in terms of economics. And the associated elements are lead, zinc and silver. The pathfinders are bismuth, tellurium, tin, arsenic, antimony and barium. The host rocks for these copper gold systems are commonly felsic volcanic, so we can characterise there that ratio. And we, we know the alteration pretty well, we can characterise that and input those into the, the algorithm. Interestingly, one of the major districts that came up was in the Alaskan range. And you can see here a Google image of all the snow-covered fields in the Alaskan range and the glaciers, these um, glaciers that are coming off um, the range down here and down here. Um, there's two main belts of anomalies that we, uh, we found, and that's a, an area of copper-nickel-cobalt uh, mineralisation we call the copper-nickel-cobalt corridor. Whether they're VMS deposits or another style of massive sulphide is actually not clear from the literature, but they certainly come up as VMS targets. And all this multicoloured squares here is indicative of the pegging that's been over that area and is currently held. If we look up here, there's another series of dots which are cobalt copper bismuth um, VMS style, and there's been a couple of um, th these actually outcrop as gossens that you can see on Google Earth when you 
when you go into the images in close, uh, close magnification. Uh, and some of those have been drilled and found out to be VHMS style of mineralisation. But interestingly, interestingly, why we were interested is they were high in bismuth. They're a, a copper cobalt bismuth type of VHMS and the cobalt, obviously, one of our critical metals was very interesting too. But really the belt that most people are interested in for VHMS is in the Southern Brooks Range. These are Devonian metavolcanics and quartz mica schists. And the deposit that's been found there back in the 1970s and 80s is the Arctic massive sulphide, about 43 million tonnes of good grade copper and zinc. Now that's not mined because this whole area doesn't have any uh, road access to it. Um, it's, a, it's amazing really, the closest road is, is over here somewhere on the, the, wet, uh, the eastern edge and to put a road in right across here to Arctic would be a mammoth job that has a lot of opposition from the local Indians and also from the environmentalists so that hasn't gone ahead. But um, South 32, the Australian company, have joint ventured into this area and their pegging is all along the Devonian volcanics, as you can see there. The other targets that we revealed, this T1 and T2, are already pegged by South 32, but there are other targets to the north that came up, but disappointingly they're within a major national park that uh, covers a lot of the northern uh, Brooks Range area. But if you go further east, there were further targets that showed up in the, what's called the Wiseman district. And this was known as an area of scarn, weak scarn mineralisation over quite a large area. Um, and it, it was currently held by a native corporation, the Doyen. Um, and so there'd been no exploration there since 1970, which was a very attractive target, seeing as no modern exploration had been undertaken. And so the company we were working for, MDF Mine Discovery Fund, optioned that area from the Doyen Native Corporation and started an exploration program over that, that area. Uh, the first thing they did was to fly airborne EM and magnetics in a very detailed pattern. And all these black areas are major magnetic anomalies that happen to coincide pretty closely with where the major scarn deposits were on surface or um, copper lead zinc mineralisation. So we had a good correlation between magnetics and mineralisation right off the bat. And that magnetic survey, very fortunately, because there's only a few rocks that are magnetic, could be inverted uh, with the modern techniques of a geophysical inversion to actually show where the granites were at depth where the fingers were that came up, or the cupolas, um, that led to the scan deposits on surface, especially in this southern part. And we came to the conclusion that this actually wasn't a VMS district, it was a, a scan porphyry district in the southern part of it. And, um, and when you look at the geology and the surface outcrops, these are some Google images just showing you these zones of alteration in the mountains uh, surrounded by carbonates which uh, a cap carbonate unit which overlies them and a generally circular area with EM anomalies um, a very strong uh, deep magnetic anomaly and areas of potassic alteration the end of last season uh, MDF drilled a hole into here that revealed significant copper grades in some of the scan and porphyry intrusions. So that's turned out to be a very exciting area um, and when you look at the magnetic inversions regionally you can see these beautiful inversion patterns that show halos of magnetic material overlying um, non-magnetic or reversely magnetised areas with scans at the surface. So these represent beautiful targets for deeper drilling, but sadly 
the company is a junior company and they haven't been able to raise the dollars required for this deeper drilling program, but hopefully a major will come along and support that in the near future. That's the interpreted position of the granites and the cupolas and their relationship to the inverted magnetics. So we'll move from Alaska now to Western Australia, where we've attempted to use the same approach in Western Australia, but the big difference between Western Australia and Alaska is all those black areas in Western Australia are a tenure. They're all ground that has been pegged. Whereas in Alaska, you can see the black areas are quite small in comparison. So there's a real difficulty in finding unpegged areas in Western Australia, as many of you would know. And when we did our plot our algorithm for BHMS targets in Western Australia, you get lots of targets, but they're all on someone else's ground. And at the time, we were looking for open ground. I mean, that's not so bad. You can sit and wait because, you know, the market's going down and eventually a lot of those juniors will get rid of their ground and it'll become available to companies that are still sticking around. So that, that'll be interesting to follow up in the future. We also looked at lithium. This is something I put up for Rowdy, who's been telling, telling me about lithium. So I said to him, I'll tell him where the new lithium deposits are. And uh, all the yellow squares are the uh, known lithium resources. The uh, purple pink dots are where, we'd, where the Mintel suggested would be the new resources. And the data from Western Australia is very dense. The government's done a very good job with their data. It's not as complete in terms of multi-element analyses, but the companies have also contributed all their data. So you have a pretty dense data set for Western Australia. You can see all these red stars are what we'd interpret as potential source rocks for lithium. And you can see they're all over the place, whereas the pink dots are a little more restricted, but Mainly they occur where the red stars are and some of them are, are finding the deposits that we know about. So it does work for lithium, it does work for rare earths, um, but Western Australia is not the best place from our point of view because it's all been pegged. But one area came up of great interest and that was a lithium cesium um, a very strongly anomalous with beryllium, rubidium, tin and tantalum in the Fortescue group, which was quite a surprise because those anomalies all occur over basaltic uh, volcanic clastic rocks. So the assumption is that is most likely lithium sievers, cesium enrichment in clays over heavily weathered basalt. You wouldn't expect that to be the case because basalt doesn't have much lithium in it. So you've got to really weather the basalt over a long period of time to concentrate up lithium to that, that extent, which is very interesting. And maybe that's uh, an area that needs investigation. I want to finish off this talk. I think I've got a few minutes <coughs> to talk about some of the advances related to multi-element geochemistry, which I have been using. In, but I, I want to particularly look at the PXRF, which can be used as a multi-element tool. <coughs> it can be used to interpret uh, lithology of downhole RC drilling or AC drilling. We can interpret geology from soil geochemistry using this approach. We can improve our diamond drill logging with multi-element geochemistry, looking particularly for target horizons and, and contacts. And we can use the PXRF to identify alteration types. And that last one is what I want to just mention briefly. Now, <clears throat> back in 20, uh, when was it? 2001, 2001, we published a paper about the alteration box plot. And this is a plot of the geochemistry of the rocks plotted on a diagram that shows where the minerals should be on that diagram if there were pure minerals like 
chlorite and pyrite and dolomite and epidote, etc. And we found that for Phanerozoic volcanics, least altered basalts would plot here, least altered dacites in there, and least altered rhyolites here. And anything outside that box was basically altered. And the closer you got to the margins, to chlorite, pyrite, or muscovite, or case bar, was an increase in the intensity of alteration. So if you take this data set, which we took straight off the Geological Survey database of basalts in the Archean, then you can see that some of them plot in the least altered box, and these were described as least altered basalts, but a lot of them plot outside that box heading towards the chloride pyrite. So what does that mean? What's that alteration telling us? Is it significant? Is it related to mineralisation? What sort of mineralisation is it related to? Some of the data is plotting up towards dolomite, so that's telling us about carbonate alteration in the basalts. Now, if you take the whole of the data set from the WASM data set plus a data set from GA, again, which are least altered rocks that have been collected and analysed for a whole range of elements, then you get this picture on the left-hand side. These are the least altered granites and rhyolites. These are the least altered going from rhyolites up through dacites. Then we get into the basalt field up here. And interestingly, the high magnesium basalts come across, right across towards the chloride end of the spectrum. And that region is quite different to the Phanerozoic volcanics. And the strongly altered rocks sit over here, right across close to this uh, boundary. And so there's a trend in the rock geochemistry across the diagram to these highly altered rocks. Now, they're not present here because this database was not meant to represent highly altered rocks. It was meant to represent the least altered rocks. <coughs> so if we take those least altered rocks and we contour them on eye gas, then you can start to see the predominance, where the predominant fields are. The, the, these are the, the least altered rhyolites and granites in that, these red areas, the least altered basalts, the least altered intermediates, and then the least altered high magnesium basalts and the least altered ultramafics are sitting right out here. Again, we haven't got many altered rocks because this database wasn't produced to look at alteration. And we can put boxes around those and you can see the boxes for Archean volcanics are very different to the Phanerozoic volcanics. They give this predominance of basalt, basalt up here and rhyolite down here. It's a two, two compositions rather than the spectrum we see in the Phanerozoic, more calcalkaline spectrum. Now, one of the problems with using the handheld PXRF to look at these compositions is that we don't have any sodium. That's a real deficiency of the handheld XRF. So I've produced this diagram I call the no-NA diagram, the NONA diagram. So we can produce an alteration box pot without sodium. And I've done that here. It still has the major elements at the the extremities of the diagram, the least altered felsics are in here, quite a, uh, quite a, um, interestingly, a, a diagonal field. The least altered uh, intermediate rocks trend across this way, and then the least altered basalts are in here. And, and we can then look at the altered rocks, which we don't have many of on this diagram, as I emphasised and where they should be. If, if the basalts are chloride altered, they should trend across the diagram to chloride. Chloride biotite, sericite will trend across here, biotite alteration down here, sericite alteration generally across here. If you've got intense sericite and chloride, they'll plot up and down this side bar. 
or intense case bar alteration will plot over here, and intense albite alteration, which we don't have many examples of, would plot down towards the albite end of the spectrum. Epidote carbonate up towards that. So you can see the value in a simple diagram like this, even from PXRF data, that not only does the PXRF allow you to determine whether you're looking at basalts, intermediate rocks, felsics, sedimentary rocks, I didn't go into that, I haven't got time, but it also can tell you about alteration. So the take home messages are two, basically, that I've learnt in the last eight years since leaving the university is that big regional multi-element geochem data sets are incredibly value for regional targeting. And they're now more commonly available to explorers in most jurisdictions. And using the full suite of elements from PXRF, most people just use the target elements, but if you use the full suite, that helps to interpret the lithology and the alteration in RC trips. Chips. And it gives a lot more confidence, I think, to the rig geologist in identifying lithology and alteration. If we could train our, our geologists on the rig to interpret the PXRF data, then you can produce logs just simply based on the PXRF. And you can look at the alteration and you can then go back and compare that to your visual log that you produced by logging the chips. And it really is an educational way of improving logging techniques because you've got the chemical data, you've got your data, and really they should be telling you the same story. So you've got to merge those together and improve your logging method in the, in the process. Thanks very much.